the third rubric under which I want to consider the Eucharist is this really wonderful idea of the real presence. We say that Jesus is really, truly, and substantially present under the forms of bread and wine. How do we get at this, and why does the church hold to it? Can I begin with the uh, scripture, this wonderful sixth chapter of John's Gospel? In fact, I'd recommend to anyone who's uh, thinking about the Eucharist to revisit this chapter six. But Jesus is now in the uh, synagogue at Capernaum, and he delivers this wonderful discourse. And he mentions that he himself is the living bread come down from heaven, at which point the people quarrel among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And again, you know, for ancient Israelites, this was extremely repugnant because there were all sorts of prohibitions in the Old Testament against eating an animal's flesh with its blood. It was strictly, you know, forbidden. So for this man to speak of, of eating his, his body and drinking his blood was just repugnant in the extreme. So, of course, they quarrel. Jesus, therefore, is given every opportunity to render his words more symbolic or more metaphorical, right? But listen to what he says. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, so I'm with great gravity. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Then he says, My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, what's interesting here, we're going to miss it because you have to know the Greek. The normal word for eat is phagain in Greek, it's people eating together. But Jesus doesn't use that word. He says, unless you, and then the word is trogain in Greek. Well, trogain has the sense of gnawing, or, or, or the way an animal would eat. So he's given the opportunity to render the words more metaphorical. In fact, he turns up the heat. He makes them more realistic. Unless you gnaw on the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. That's the ground, I would say, for the church's claim over the centuries that Jesus is, in some sense, you know, though the church has struggled hard to understand that, really, truly, and substantially present. Notice, too, right after this famous speech, many of his disciples leave him. This has always been a standing and falling point. It's always been a, a divisive point. But the church, the Catholic Church, has hung on to this idea of the real presence. Well, how can we begin to understand it? Can I suggest by looking at the power of words? Now, words are descriptive, so I could describe to you what's in this room. My words aren't changing reality, they're simply describing what's here. However, there are certain, even human words, that don't just describe reality, they change reality. For example, uh, if you walk up to me at a, a party and I said, you're under arrest, well, you'd think I was joking around with you. But if a properly deputized and uniformed policeman walked up to you and said, you're under arrest, well, whether you like it or not, you're under arrest. Because his words, given his status and his identity, his words change reality. They actually place you under arrest. Or if... Um, you're at a baseball game and you see the you know, player coming around second base and he slides into third base and, and you're in the stands and you say, uh, safe. Well, all you're doing is expressing your, your opinion. Your opinion doesn't change the game, right? But right in front of you is a uniformed and deputized uh, umpire of the National League and he says, you're out. Well, whether the runner likes it or not, whether you like it or not, he is in fact out. The umpire's words have changed reality. Or just think of the way, you know, our words can wound someone or can lift somebody up. Words that I've said to people, I know, uh, have probably hurt them over many, many years or have lifted them up. Words can change reality, even our puny human words. Now consider the Word of God. So at the very beginning of the Bible, we hear that God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the earth come forth, and it came forth. The idea is that God's word is not descriptive so much as creative. It doesn't just change reality the way ours can. It constitutes reality in the deepest way. Now watch that theme throughout the Bible. 
the book of the prophet Isaiah, we have that wonderful passage, you know, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and don't return without watering the earth. So my word goes forth from me and does not return in vain without effecting what it was sent to accomplish. God's holy word is not just descriptive, it is creative, it is constitutive. Okay, now fast forward to Jesus. Like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, one of the prophets, no, 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 infinitely more than that. Because Jesus is, we say, the word, that same word by which God makes the universe, that word now become flesh. Which is why when Jesus speaks, things change. Little girl, get up. Talitha kumi, it's, it's kept in the Aramaic in the gospel. Beautifully, they remembered his words. Talitha kumi, little girl, get up. And she got up. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. My son, your sins are forgiven. And by God, his sins are forgiven. Jesus' word affects reality. Now, at the climax of his life, when he gathers with his disciples for this last great meal, he's God feeding his people. When he gathers and he pronounces the words of sacrifice, my body which will be given for you, my blood poured out for you. He says, this is my body, taking the bread. Over the cup, this is the chalice of my blood. Just describing something, just engaging in symbolic speech. Not if it's Jesus who's speaking. If the word of God is the one who's speaking, then what he says is. The bread and wine have become, at their deepest level, something different. They've been changed by the power of the divine word into the body and blood of Christ. That's why many centuries later, when the Council of Trent describes what's going on, they say, the elements change, vi verborum, Latin for, by the power of the words. The priest at Mass is not speaking his own words. Rather, it's the priest in the vestments of the temple priest, acting and speaking, we say, in persona Christi, in the person of Christ says over the bread, this is my body, over the chalice, this is my blood. In saying that, Christ, through the ministration of the priest, effects that same change, and he becomes really, truly, and substantially present. Just a last observation. I talked about the change at the level of substance. Thomas Aquinas gives us that theory of transubstantiation. We say that the substance or deepest reality of the bread changes into the body of Christ. The substance or deepest reality of the wine changes into the blood of Christ. This depends upon that distinction between appearance and reality. And you can find that in, in ancient philosophy, modern philosophy, and so on. Very often, appearance and reality come together. Things are as they seem, but not always. Sometimes things look a certain way, but they really aren't that way. Think of uh, gazing up into the, the stars and the sky you know, on a, on a clear night. And you say, well, there are the stars and so on. Uh, actually, you're looking deep into the past because it's taken so long for that light to reach your eye. You're actually looking not into the present, but the past. What seems isn't always really the case. Or if you say that, you know, about someone you've just met, boy, that person really seems like a, like a jerk. And someone else says, no, I, I know he can seem that way, but he really isn't. Someone that knows him better. Appearance and reality don't always coincide. And so with the Eucharist, we can say, indeed, the accidents remain. That means the appearances of bread and wine remain. But yet, through the power of Christ's word, the deepest reality has changed. That's the transubstantiation the church talks about. Now, just final observation. It was uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, the German philosopher, who said famously, man is what he eats. Der Mensch isst, was er isst. You are what you eat. 
that's true, isn't it? I mean, our our bodies are simply uh, made up of what we've we've eaten and drunk and so on over the years. Well, the Eucharist, really, truly, and substantially, the body and blood of Christ. When we eat the Eucharist, we become what we eat. We become assimilated to Christ, drawn ever deeper into the power of his mystical body. That's why the real presence, insisted upon by Jesus himself, articulated over the centuries by the church, remains of central importance. 